Hi, I'm Rick, and this is Steve. Welcome to another episode of Rock Shovels and Manuscripts. And where are we going today? We are going to the country of Jordan. Excellent. But then again, in the Bible, it wasn't called Jordan. Um, the area, you know, boundaries move, and what they're yeah. called in antiquity isn't necessarily what they're called today. For example, um, when the nation of Israel was first formed in 1948, it was actually called Palestine. Israelis called themselves Palestinians. That is very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Just to give you an example of how extreme changes can happen in such a short time. Oh my goodness. The country of Jordan was formed by the League, slash, uh, League of Nations slash United Nations. But before that, it was not called Jordan. Back in the days of Yeshua, it had some different names, even back then in the days of the patriarchs. So today we call it Jordan. Um, that area in part was called Arabia, even though there's other parts called Arabia. Um, Moab and Edom, uh, the region of the Nabataeans okay. would be another one. And Edom became known as Idumea hmm. later on in history. Well, I got to tell you up front, my prejudice is if, it, if there's something taking place in the land of Israel, then there's a lot of archaeological history behind it. But Jordan, really? Jordan, really. Okay. First of all, the area that we call Jordan today wasn't always under the control of foreign governments. Hmm. At times, it was under the control of Israel. And there was always, if not under the control of Israel, at war with Israel, and sometimes control would pass <laughs> back and forth. Okay. So, Mount Nebo, that's our first stop on our journey through Jordan. Excellent. And it's significant because this is the view from the top of that mountain that Moses had of the Promised Land. That is gorgeous. Let me read to you Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 1 through 6. Then Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab. And by the way, he climbed this mountain at 120 years of age. <laughs> I, have, I have a feeling he was in pretty good shape. He was in good shape. In fact, the scripture specifically says that God preserved his natural energy mm. and that he was just as strong at the age of 120 as he was when he was a young man. Wow. So he climbs to the top of this mountain. And from there, the Lord showed him, and I'm quoting, the whole land from Gilead to Dan, all of Naphtali, all of the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah, as far as the Western Sea. The Western Sea is the Mediterranean Sea. So from the top of that mountain in Jordan, on a clear day, you can see the glimmers of the Mediterranean Sea. I have actually stood right there and looked out, and it's amazing. It's an amazing view, and you can just see for, it seems like forever. You can see forever. Yeah. yeah. So it was the perfect place for God to take him so he could see the promised land. And then the Lord said to him, this is the land I promised on oath hmm. to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your own eyes, but you will not cross over into it. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. He buried him in Moab, in the valley opposite of Beth Peor, but to this day, no one knows where his grave is. Now, there's an interesting story in the New Covenant Scriptures about the devil contending for the body of Moses yes. with Michael. Mm -hmm. And we don't know exactly where that grave is, but it's somewhere in this region. And I just find it interesting that the Lord buried Moses. Mm -hmm. Moses and God were friends. This was like God officiating oh. at a memorial service for his friend. I gotta tell you something else that I really enjoy about those little statements made about, you know, the devil contending for the body of Moses, mm -hmm. which comes from, you know, today we have these little scraps that come to us called apocryphal works, right, that have come down through the centuries. And that comes from a book we know of now. It's called The Assumption of Moses. Yes. Uh, we're not saying that that's a part of Scripture by any right. means. But these little stories that are alluded to within the Scriptures always fascinate me. They do, me too. Yeah. So there we are in Jordan on Mount Nebo. Probably not the most famous archaeological site or referenced geographical site. I think the most famous or at least the most popular today, is Petra. Mm. And one of the things I find so fascinating about Petra and its popularity, it has nothing to do with the scriptures. Sort of. 
What I mean by that is there's this belief that in the future, so it hasn't happened yet, that in the future, the children of Israel are going to flee the promised land to escape the Antichrist and are going to hole up in Petra. Mm -hmm. And so now everybody flocks to Petra convinced this is the place. And it may be, but we don't know for sure. Right. Um, let me tell you where this idea comes from. Okay. It starts off in Daniel 11.41, where there's this hint that Jordan will be the area. It's more than a hint. The area that we call Jordan will be out of the Antichrist control. We don't know why. It doesn't say. But we know the Antichrist has taken over everything. But for some reason, he doesn't have authority there. All right. So we know that according to the book of Revelation, in part in other places, Israel will flee to a place of safety. Mm -hmm. And Jordan has this amazing pre-built, prefabricated city waiting in the mountains for somebody to move into. That's really below ground level. And, and, and it's carved into rocks. Yes. I mean, it's, it's about as safe as you can get. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like a, a tribulation prepper bunker. <laughs> <laughs> so they can go there and be ride out the tribulation yes. and wait for the Messiah to they return. They have an amazing channel system for water. So when it rains, all the water is collected. It's really amazing. I mean, the concept that this place was built, inhabited, vacated, and left vacant for centuries mm -hmm. in anticipation for the fulfillment of prophecy mm -hmm. It does give one goosebumps. It really does, <laughs> because there's a whole city that is carved into the sides of these hills. It's just crazy It is. Cool. It's amazing. And as the pictures demonstrate, it is beautiful. Mm -hmm. These weren't cavemen. No. But these were people living in caves. Yes. But when you look at the beauty of this, it's just mm -hmm. stunning. So Daniel 11 talks about this area being protected or preserved from the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 12, 14 talks about the woman fleeing into the wilderness to a place prepared for her. Oh, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. So I can see why people yeah, might think cool. that's the place. And then in Isaiah chapter 63, it says the Lord is shown as coming from Bozra. And many scholars have identified Bozra with Petra and this okay. area. And so they put one and two and three together and say, hey, mm -hmm. this is the place. Mm -hmm. It may be, it may not be but it's certainly a beautiful place to visit. Yes. Uh, what do you think about the, the, the phrase that they call it by today, which is Wadi Moshe, which is the wash of, of Moses, the wash of Moses. So I guess some believe that that's actually part of the trail, the pathway in which Moses brought the children of Israel. It's conceivable. This is the general area where a lot of those things happened. We're not far from Jericho here. Mm. We know they crossed over and invaded Jericho. Mm -hmm. So it's very conceivable. Well, then to me, it lends further credence to the idea that the place that he brings them through is actually the place that they go back to. Now, how cool would that be? Exactly. <laughs> I brought you in, I'm bringing you out. Same path. That would be amazing. Just a thought. It's a good thought. I like it. <laughs> All right. So we're still in the area of Jordan, Edom, Moab, and there's a place there called Machiris. Um, we've got a hill, a photo that I want the people to look at. This is the fort location of a place that the, what we'll call today, Israelis had control of. Let me give you a little bit of history, okay? So I can help you understand how this happened. Okay. In the days of the first century, in the days of Yeshua, in the days of John the Baptist, we have a series of events from prior to the Maccabees that led up to something that happened here. So I'm gonna to have to give you the history to get you here so it'll all make sense. Okay. Alexander the Great came into the region around 300 BC. He conquered the entire region. When he came to Jerusalem, the elders threw open the city gates. Now Jerusalem is a fort. They could have walled off and tried to fight off the invaders. But the high priest had a, had a dream sent from God. And he said, I want you to open the gates to this man. I want you to dress up in all of your regalia, in all of your, your uniform. And I want you to process out and welcome this man into your city. This is a dream that the high priest had. It sounded nuts, but everybody believed him. So they were behind him. 
They knew Alexander was coming. Alexander the destroyer of nations. Yes. Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. Who never loses battles. Never loses <laughs> battles. I don't want you to fight him. I want you to open the gates to him. Now, this is even more stunning because they had reason to fear Alexander specifically. Because when Alexander was fighting the Persians, he asked for our help, Israel's help. Israel said, no, we are faithful to the Persians. Remember, the Persians let us come home. We had a covenant with the Persians. We were their vassals. And we were faithful to our oaths. So Alexander now just defeated the people that we were faithful to, whom we refused to help him. The end result for refusing to help a conquering king is to be conquered. Yes. God said, I've got this one. Open the gates. Greet him as a dignitary. So the high priest said, praise the Lord. I've heard from the Lord. We're going to do this. So they go out to meet Alexander. Alexander, the great, the conqueror of nations, gets off his horse and bows to the ground before the high priest. Now, Alexander's generals are besides themselves. This is, this is the man who says, jump off a cliff and you jump. Mm -hmm. He doesn't bow before anybody. And here he's doing it before these Jewish people, That's these right. people he should be conquering, right. who are less than a flea and a dog. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, you misunderstand. I'm not bowing before the priest. I'm bowing before the name on his garment. What? Alexander said, before I even came east, I had a vision. And in this vision, the God spoke to me and said, go east and conquer, and I will give all the lands into your hands. And in the vision, he saw this priest in this robe exactly as he looked right now. And so he saw this as the confirmation of the vision. The priest got the dream. Alexander got the dream. And the end result was Jerusalem was the only city that Alexander conquered that he didn't conquer. It's the only country that he conquered that he did not force Hellenism on. Every other nation had to follow the language, the customs, and the religion of the Greeks. But because the God of Israel spoke to him in a dream, he let Israel keep their own religion. <laughs> That's beyond amazing. You don't hear about this every day, and but it, it's recorded. It also speaks to me of that God can do whatever he wants to do with whomever he wants to do it. Yep. And he rarely repeats himself. He just is original in every possible way. Now, all this stuff I'm sharing with you is not in the Bible. Sure. We know about it because of archaeology. Mm -hmm. It's from ancient manuscripts, particularly Josephus, mm -hmm. not to mention some things we learn about this era from other books. Mm -hmm. So archaeology supplements and helps us understand the Bible tremendously. Absolutely. Well, I've got a lot more to say, so we're going to have to pick up again because I want to go into the rest of this story. Okay, we're going to do it. So don't go away because we're not going to, and we'll see you when we get right back. Welcome back. Steve, you were right in the middle of telling us this fascinating tale about history from, I think you said, Josephus. Yes, and I was talking to you about Alexander the Great and how God spoke to him in a dream, spoke to the high priest, they met each other, and it ended up resulting in Israel being saved from Alexander's wrath and from the forced conversion to Hellenism. See, that's just crazy cool. So Alexander was only around 30 years old. I mean, he was a young man, a young conquering general, but he died young. And his vast empire was divided up between four generals. Mm -hmm. uh, two of those generals constantly contended for the land we call Israel. One was in the north. He was Seleucus. One was in the south. He was Ptolemy. Ptolemies were Egyptian, Greek Egyptians. The Seleucids were Syrian Egyptians, okay. uh, Syrian Greeks. Mm -hmm. So if the Egyptians had sway over Israel, they maintained Alexander's policy. Leave the Jews alone. They don't have to follow Hellenism, the Greek religion and culture. Alexander left them alone. We'll leave them alone. But the Syrians had a king arise whose name was Antiochus. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to conquer this area that Alexander left alone and force Hellenism on them too. His name is Antiochus, but he's known as Antiochus Epiphanes. Epiphany Epiphanes means the manifest God. See, what he did, amongst other things, is he actually went into Israel, 
he conquered the people, took over the temple, set up an image of himself in the holy place. He called it Zeus, but it looked like him. Because he's the manifest image of God. Exactly. Gotcha. And he demanded the Jewish people worship him and the rest of the Greek gods. Those who refused were executed. And so the Jewish people were in a horrible dilemma. His soldiers were going from town to town, forcing them to worship his idols and sacrifice pigs. So everything is opposite of what they would do in their own culture and religion. Yeah, he, he was intentionally humiliating mm. and trying to end Judaism. Well, a family of faithful priests, whom we now know as the Maccabeans, but they were the Hasmonean or the Hasmonean clan, decided, no, we're going to fight. And they sent out the call. All who, are in faithful, all who are faithful in Israel, come to us. We're going to, going to fight. The leader, Mattathias, said, this has happened to us because of our own sin. We know, according to the Torah, that God will protect us from our enemies unless we stumble into sin, and then he said these things would happen. So first, we must, ser must search our souls and repent before God. And they did. Now we'll fight. And it doesn't matter that they outnumber us. Five to one, eight to one, ten for, to one. It doesn't matter if they're trained soldiers and we're farmers and fishermen. If we're right with God, we've got the promise of the covenant. God himself will protect us. Let's fight. Awesome. And they fought. <laughs> and they won. Battle after battle after battle. Impossible odds. Mattathias dies. His son Judah takes over. Judah Maccabee becomes an amazing leader. He dies. His brothers take their place. One of the brothers' name was Hyrcanus, John Hyrcanus. Now John, bless his heart, <laughs> he decided to not just, they've already kicked the Syrians out. Now they're kind of getting chummy chummy with Rome. This is where the Roman Empire starts to become friends with Israel. They make a covenant with Rome. We'll get back to that perhaps later if we have time. But what I want to tell you at this point, we're no longer protecting ourselves from the Syrian Greeks. Now we're expanding our empire. Hyrcanus takes over the area of Jordan, Edom, Moab, the Idumeans. Okay. And he does to them what the Syrians try to do to us. He forced conversion upon the Idumeans. One of the leaders of the Idumeans was a guy named Antipater. Most people don't know about Antipater, but they know about one of his sons. His son's name is Herod. Mm. Herod was appointed by Antipater through the fellowship with Rome, who is now coming to the ascendancy in this area, to govern the area of Judea. Mm. So Herod is the son of a forced Jewish convert. Herod was not really a Jew, and so he wasn't really respected and accepted by the Jewish people as a Jew, but more seen as some sort of weird Roman Jewish half-breed thing. Mm -hmm. And he was harsh. He came in and he massacred tons of people to take over the country. In fact, Herod is responsible for wiping out the last of the Hashmoneans. The Hashmoneans forced the Edomites to become Jews. And now the Edomites come back and wipe out the Hashmoneans. It's a funny twist of fate. Mm -hmm. Well, Herod's son is named, he had several sons and they took over different areas of the empire. One of them was named Antipas, named after Antipater. Got it. So in the Bible, we have Herod the Great, we have Herod Antipas, we have Herod Agrippa, and we have Herod Philip. In fact, and another Herod Agrippa. Gets rather confusing. The Herod of the Gospels, the Herod most often referenced, is Herod Antipas. He was the son of Herod the Great. He now is in charge of the area down around the Dead Sea, the area of Perea, the area where Macarus sits. He builds there a fort and also a prison. Now here's where the story starts intersecting more with the New Testament account. There was a guy preaching in this area. His name was John. And Antipas heard of him, and Antipas wanted to meet him and wanted to hear from him. And met him, he did. And John excoriated him. And he chewed him out publicly for taking his brother Philip's wife. 
Probably not the wisest thing to do if you wanted to have any kind of popularity with this guy, right? <laughs> not with a prophet, no. <laughs> okay. Not the best course okay, of action. Okay, I'm just curious. So here's then what happens. He imprisons him, but he still likes him, kind of fears him, kind of trusts him, kind of doesn't. Okay. But he's keeping him in prison. It's the safest place to keep the guy right now. Yeshua's ministry is now starting in the north. John's in prison in the south. He's in Machaerus. Antipas, Herod, has taken his brother Philip's wife, and now they're having a party. And his brother Philip's wife, Salome, dances. Mm. She dances and pleases Herod well. And he said, you are so beautiful. You are so amazing. You dance so well. Ask anything and I will give it to you, even up to half of my kingdom. She confers with her mom. Goes back to Herod. I would like right now, on a platter, the head of John the Baptist. I'm sure this woman, hell hath no fury, like a woman scorned. He just called her out for her improper marriage, and now she's getting her revenge. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't long after this that Eretus, the king of Petra, that whole area, the Nabataeans, declared war against Herod, and he won. And according to Josephus, the Jewish community saw that as God's justice for his sin of adultery and his sin of beheading the just baptizer named John. And that's all recorded in antiquity, in the archaeological record, in the writings of Josephus. Amazing. And it parallels perfectly the account we have in the Gospels. Beautifully. In fact, you have a, a piece of that, don't you? I do. And it reads this way in Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 6. When Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced in the midst and pleased Herod, exactly the story you were saying. Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatever she would ask. And she, being put forward by her mother, said, Give me here in a charger or a plate the head of John the Baptist. And the king was grieved, but for the sake of his oaths and of them which sat and ate with him, he commanded it to be given. And he sent and beheaded John in prison. And his head was brought on a plate and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the corpse and buried him. And they went and told Jesus about it. Yep, it matches up beautifully. Yeah. Josephus' story is supplemental information mm -hmm. to what we have in the Bible. Yes. Let me read to you a piece of what Josephus wrote about this. Okay. It comes from his writings, and I quote, this comes from the Antiquities of the Jews, book uh, 18. But this Herod Philip, whose wife Herod the Tetrarch, this is Antipas, Herod the Tetrarch, Tetrarch, a, one leader of four, okay. four brothers. Okay. But this Herod Philip, whose wife Herod the Tetrarch had married, and that in her husband's lifetime, and when her first husband had issue by her, for which adulterous and incestuous marriage John the Baptist justly reproved Herod the Tetrarch, and for which reproof Salome, the daughter of Herodias, by her first husband Herod Philip, who was still alive, occasioned him to be unjustly beheaded. There's more. If we had time, I'd read it. But that's just a nice synopsis of what was said. Matches perfectly. Written around the same time period, if not the exact time period. Yes. Yes. Now, because we know where Machaerus was, we have some, they've dug up some of the footprint and looked at some of the rocks. They've given us a model of what the fortress would have looked like. And so we have that for us to look at. That is amazing. Now, this is taken from Biblical Archaeology Society's website. Okay. This was one of their experts' drawings on what the Palace of Machaerus looked like based on not only what they dug up at the site, but other writings and palaces of the time and It area. is much larger than I thought. Well, let's zoom in and take a look at the courtyard. This wow. is where Salome would have danced. So it was undoubtedly a nice mm -hmm. outdoor party. Good times had by all. <laughs> Except John. <laughs> Except for when it got to John, exactly. And I'm sure it ruined Herod's day as well. Yes. Because he, he kind of liked said. John. Yeah. yeah. He, he didn't want to do this. So why did he? This was an honor-shame culture. Mm. He gave his word, and to take it back would have made him look like an idiot. Mm -hmm. And he just didn't have the backbone to look like an idiot. It would have been better to have broken his word than to commit murder. Reminds me of being careful of the vows we make. 
I think that's why Yeshua said it's better not to make any oaths at all. Mm -hmm. James said, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Because you never, how can you make a vow about the future if you don't know what the future is exactly. going to bring? Exactly, and what it's going to entangle you in, Yep. like this happened right exactly. here. Exactly. Uh, God wants us to keep our word, so if keeping our word could get us into trouble, mm -hmm. better not to make promises we don't have to make. Is that one of the main lessons we learn from this site? It's one of many. <laughs> it's one of many. Starting with Alexander, the dangers of Hellenism, going into the faith that God preserves his own, and even when Hellenism wasn't forced on us, we stepped into it, rejecting the sin of forced conversion, and then we forced it on others. Mm -hmm. So the lesson of hypocrisy, of entanglement with the world, mm -hmm. the lesson that we got from Moses coming into the borders of the promised land, but because of sin, not quite being able to get there. Sin, as opposed to God's holiness, the blessings of walking with God, and the consequences of rejecting or walking in sin. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's amazing what you can pull from the dirt, the lessons you can learn from the rocks. Shovels. And manuscripts. And manuscripts. <laughs> <laughs> I think out of all the things that have ever been dug up, the most valuable to me are the manuscripts. Because you can pull out a, a jar and say, hey, that's, what's that mean? But when you pull out a manuscript, you get to read what somebody says it means. That's amazing. Yeah. Steve, thank you. And thanks for joining us again for Rock Shovels and Manuscripts. We will see you again next week. This episode was produced by and for God's Learning Channel. If you're enjoying this series, your financial support will help us keep this program on the air. Simply send your contribution to God's Learning Channel, P.O. Box 61000, Midland, Texas 79711-1000. Or log on to our website at www.glc.us.com and donate using PayPal. Please be sure to designate which program your contribution is intended to support. Thank you for helping us make unique quality programming a reality. Order your copy of this program from the GLC Bookstore by calling the numbers or visiting the website on your screen. Please include the program number when ordering.